We do have a number of people that we need to continue to pray for. Uh, there are a number of folks who are out sick, and um, they have different, different ailments. Not everything is COVID, um, but there are some who are battling that. There are others who are battling uh, other things <clears throat> going on uh, physically, um, so we need to remember all of those. It's good to have Frankie with us this morning. You've been praying for him, and I asked him, uh, he had some surgery this week. I said, why are you here? And he said, well, I was coming to church. And so uh, if you see Frankie this morning, just make sure you don't hug him real hard. Um, just uh, tell him you're going to continue to lift him up and pray for him and uh, that he can get better. So it's good to see him with us. Many others who've been out uh, for a while, you're back with us this morning as well, and, and uh, so thankful for that. As we mentioned earlier, you do have visitor cards, so we'd ask you to fill those out. It's good to have those of you that are visiting with us today. As I sit here, um, it is a is an emotional moment for me as I look out on this <laughs> church and see the people that are here and and just how God has blessed Pine Island in so many ways. And, and we can sit and, and, and kind of think about all the things that God has done for us and, and how he's blessed us, but if we don't take care of it through prayer, if we don't bathe each other in prayer, if we don't bathe the church in prayer and all that is happening, then, boy, can we ever be in trouble. We can really be in trouble. Um, I want to just read a few things this morning before we get into the, the, the message, before we get into the text. And there are three people that I want you to think about. These three people most of you probably know. If you don't, uh, take a picture of that behind me and go and look these people up because these are some very influential folks. Uh, Corten Boone was a very faithful, faithful servant of God. She was amazing to, to know of and to read about and, and just to, to know the story that she had. And, and then, of course, Oswald Chambers. Many of you uh, have a devotional book. Uh, you've read that. You've, you've had it for years, some of you. And others, D.L. Moody. Dwight L. Moody, what a, what a man of faith and a man of prayer. Um, he was a, a, a man who literally spent most of his day uh, in prayer. So I want to read some uh, things from them. First of all, we never know how God will answer our prayers, but we can expect that he will get us involved in his plan for the answer. If we are true intercessors, we must be ready to take part in God's work on behalf of the people for whom we pray. Corey, Tin, Boom. You think about this faithful person who went through so much and literally saw some of the most horrible things in life, and yet you hear in her heart here the importance of intercessory prayer. And when we pray for people we must also, she says, take part, be willing to take part in the answer of that prayer. It would be like you asking God to clothe someone and yet never going to your own closet to give them clothes. That doesn't make sense, does it? Like we should be reaching in to our own closet, to our own things that God's given us and, and say, Lord, give me the wisdom to know what they need and how to help. And then the next one is true intercession involves bringing the person are the circumstance that seems to be crashing in on you before God until you are changed by his attitude toward that person or circumstance. People describe intercession by saying it is putting yourself in someone else's place. Oswald Chambers says that is not true. Intercession is putting yourself in God's place. It is having his mind and his perspective. When you come to that place for intercessory, you are putting yourself in a place, in a position to say, God, use me to bring healing. Use me to fix the situation. God, use me to be the hands, the feet of Christ. So often we think that prayer, well, we always say prayer is the answer. Well, prayer is the answer as long as you're willing to put feet to the prayer. Prayer is the answer as long as it is truly prayed in faith and you're saying to God, Lord, use me however you desire in answering this. And D.L. Moody said, every great movement of God can be traced to a kneeling figure. Every great movement of God can be traced to a kneeling figure. Think about this for a moment. The great revivals, 
the Great Awakening. I imagine when this church was built back in 1888. Some of you didn't know that. This church was founded in 1888. And at one point, the storm that hit Galveston in 1900 came and blew this thing away. But the people gathered again, and they began, I'm sure, to seek God and to pray. And they used that old wood that had blown down to then form the flooring of what sits right over here next door to us. Now, there's nothing original left in that building except for one thing. And I believe this with all my heart, the power of prayer. Since 1888, God has used prayer to move Pine Island. Every great thing that has happened at this church came because of people kneeling down, putting themselves in in, in, in the way, uh, not in the way, but in, in the use of God, putting themselves saying, God, whatever you desire, we will do. Folks, the church prayer list this morning has to start in a particular way. And God is going to give us wisdom this morning on how to pray, the attitude of the proper prayer of the church, what we should be doing to have our prayers answered so that we know how to pray. A lot of times we pray, but if we're honest, we probably don't pray correctly. A lot of our prayers sometimes can be very selfish. Would anybody agree with that? Matter of fact, a lot of times we don't even reach out to God until we, quote, need him. Boy, what a sad answer that is, right? I want to look this morning in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12 through 22. If you visit with us, if you're visiting with us today, you've never been here before, we stand for the reading of God's word. So let's stand together. I recently was asked by some of our folks, why do we always stand during the song service and then we stand again during the reading of the word? And they said, you know, when we were growing up, we always sat in between some of these songs. I said, yeah, but in the Early church, I imagine they had to stand. As a matter of fact, I can imagine that outside of windows of house churches, people would stand and just stick their head in because they just wanted to hear. So this morning, we stand in honor of God's word. First Thessalonians 5, verse 12 says, But we ask you, brothers and sisters, to recognize those who diligently labor among you and are in leadership over you in the Lord and give you instruction, and that you regard them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. We urge you, brothers and sisters, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek what is good for one another and for all people. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not... Utterly reject prophecies, but examine everything. Hold firmly to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Father, we thank you for your wisdom here. We thank you, Father, that you have shown us that things have to be in order when we pray. Our hearts need to be in order. Our thoughts need to be in order. And Father, I thank you that this church has taken very seriously the very first part of this, of loving their pastor, loving their leadership. What I've told people often is, I know how good I have it. I am beyond blessed. And I am very well taken care of by the people of this church. So Father, thank you that they grasp that, that they understand that part. And thank you, Father, that they pray for me daily. Well, let us look into your word today and glean from it what we need to learn. In Christ's name I pray, amen. The first thing the Bible tells us here in 1 Thessalonians is that we are to recognize those who diligently labor among you. First of all, let me tell you that I am very thankful that you recognize your Uh, folks who work here, not just the ministers, but I believe that you recognize all of the staff that works here at Pine Island that serves God uh, here, that labors among you and are in leadership over you in the Lord. If you're wondering, am I going to be one of those preachers who's going to stand up here and say, you ought to do this for me and that for me? No, 
I know how good I have it here. I am not crazy. I get it, folks. I'm not one of those guys who's going to ask for a plane, just a boat. But um, we, that's the second week in a row I've done that, hadn't it? It's going to catch on eventually. I'm positive of it. Um, but no, I, I'm not, I understand. You guys understand this. You recognize this. You, you love us. You serve us. You give to us. Um, you recognized me when I turned 50 and made fun of me, and I thought it was awesome. Then you threw a party for my wife who wound up sick, and it was a sweet party because y'all think women don't deserve the same treatment that y'all gave your pastor, and I agree with that. I agree with that. It was a very beautiful thing, and, but you recognize us. You love us, and we see that. Folks, I'm telling you, we recognize the love that you have for us as husband and wife and me as a pastor. You regard us very highly and love us because of the work that we do here. I want to say thank you for that. But then the next part says this, live in peace with one another. Live in peace with one another. Folks, one of the things that Satan will do to tear a church apart is he will do this. He will get two, three, four, five people to disagree on something very minor. And once they've disagreed on something very minor, guess what happens? It's like a cancer, and it begins to grow. And the next thing you know, instead of it being something minor, it has now infected the entire church. And all of a sudden, what was once a united body and a united front, a united family, a united community, a united people, we now pick sides. That is why God says to live peaceably with one another. Folks, you don't understand. Like, if if we have something against one another... God is very clear before we begin to pray, before we begin to do things, we have to get those things right. Just like taking the Lord's Supper, it's something that's very important that you and I don't have something against one of our brothers or sisters. And if we do, the Bible says to get up and to leave that place and to go take care of that. Why? Because the Bible teaches us, God understood that one small bit of restlessness between members and cause a great cancer. And what God has built, you and I can tear down just like that. Did you catch that part? Think about some of the great churches that once had hundreds of people in it, and now very few darken the door. Something happened. Some sort of cancer took place. Some disagreement took place. So one of the things here at our church, we say, listen, the 50-50 rule when it comes to voting, no, that's out the door here. It's 90-10, 90%, so that way we get it right. And then after that done, if the, if the 10% understand that the 90% has said yes, then the 10% come along and say, we will change it. And so we're all in agreement. You say, well, that sounds crazy. No, it doesn't. Because if we're not together, we're divided. And Satan will use division to absolute ruin what God is doing. Live in peace. Live in peace. It might start in your own home that peace needs to come. And then from there, if there's anything outside of the home within the church, you go and you take care of it. It's amazing. When we go and actually do what God has called us to do, how good God is at finding out that a lot of the things that we thought had happened were just simple, what? Misunderstandings. Live in peace with one another. Admonish the unruly. Don't let things get out of hand. You ever been to those churches where everybody does this? Well, that's just who they are. Do you know that that's just who they are will ruin everything? Well, that's just the way it is. I mean, we, we, all, we all know that person. <laughs> if we, yeah, well, somebody needs to go to that person in love and deal with that. And then we're to encourage the faint-hearted. Let me ask a question, if I can, real quick. 
who in here has in the since 2020 March of 2020 anybody in here ever become faint hearted it's just kind of like man are we ever going to get through this and, and life seems to happen, and, and you have plans, and the next thing you know, you get sick, or somebody else gets sick, and everything changes. Folks, I want to encourage you that God is still on his throne. I want to encourage you that God knows your name. I want to encourage you that God knows the very number of hair upon your head. And for some of us, it's a lot easier to count than others. I get that. But isn't it good to know that God knows exactly how much is there? I encourage you that God is not done. There's a whole lot more to happen before this world ends. And I encourage you to stand fast. I encourage you to stay strong. I encourage you to step up. And in so doing, we help the weak those who are struggling, those who are tired. And this is the easiest one of all. Denton challenged this morning with some tough things. He kept saying, now this is going to be harder, this is going to be harder. I want to tell you this morning, this one's going to be the easiest of all. Be patient. Right? Be patient. Not a problem, correct? Anybody in here struggle with being patient? Okay, now but let's rein this in. Let's get this understanding. We're talking about spiritually be patient. See, in our mind, our patience is what we do. I don't know. This is a spiritual thing he is talking about. And what he's saying is you have got to learn that even though it seems as though God may not have heard your prayer, may not have heard your cry, be patient and trust that God's timing is perfect. Be patient. Wait on the Lord. Don't get ahead. Don't go ahead of what God is doing. Be patient with everyone because God is doing a work. Sometimes we'll begin, we'll be praying for somebody and we don't see any change. And here's what we say. Well, there's no hope for them. Can I tell you something? Aren't you glad somebody was praying for you and they never said, well, there's no hope for them? Be patient when people are struggling. Be patient when people fail. Be patient when people walk away from the church. And trust that God's word will not return void within their life. Be patient. Continue to pray. Then he says this. Don't take revenge. No evil for evil. Does anybody in here struggle with wanting to get back with somebody as soon as they've done something to you? Right? Okay, good. There's some of y'all raised your hands that were honest. Right? How many of you have ever wanted to lay hands on someone and then you say, well, that's biblical, right? <laughs> wrong type of hands. Wrong type of hands, right? He says this, see that no one repays another evil for evil. I've been to enough business meetings in Baptist churches. This is not always practiced. Just say amen if that's true. Some of y'all been there, right? Y'all sat through them. People always ask me, Brother Tom, would you rather do a wedding or a funeral? What do y'all think my answer is? You're like, probably a wedding. Negative. Negative. Let me tell you why. I have watched Christian families come together, bring Christian child meets Christian child in the church. Both families are strong in the church. They love each other. But man, when it comes to uniting those two families together, they can't even agree on how the flowers are going to go. They can't agree. So what I do to solve this problem is I just kick everybody out. And I talk just to the couple getting married and I ask them exactly what they want. And then when it's time to do the wedding, the night rehearsal, I sit everybody down, and, and this is what I do. All right, I'm glad y'all are all here. The bride and groom and I have already sat down. We know exactly what's going to happen. All I need y'all to do is what we tell you to do. Nope, don't need that. Nope, not going to do that. We've already decided. 
And I've watched how Christian families can wind up just almost hating each other. They've been in church their whole life together. Their kids fell in love in the same church. But then all of a sudden, something that's supposed to unite us tears us apart. And families are tore up because nobody understands that you can go without your opinion. You can just do what others want. And even if you don't like it, what do we say around here? You suck it up, buttercup. But oftentimes we see families just seek evil. They go out and they gossip about each other. Let me tell you what they did at the wedding. Did you believe that she wore that? That color? Can I ask a question? Why do we get so mad about colors, too? I have, that one. I have, I have yet to figure that one out, right? Because the man puts on whatever she told him to put on. It's the women that get upset about the colors. Man, Patty, you should have had this figured out by now. <clears throat> the reality of it is, is that in church, we're to love each other. And let's keep going here. No revenge. Seek what is good. Seek what is good. Even, listen, even if it's not good for you necessarily, your number one job is to seek what is good for everybody else. The Bible tells us to serve others, to put others above ourselves. If all that matters to you in the church is what matters to you, you're probably the problem. Seek good. Rejoice. This is what he says. Rejoice always. Anybody in here struggle with rejoicing always? It's easy to rejoice when everything's what? Going good. But then all of a sudden when life goes the other direction, can you still rejoice? I'm telling you the most powerful picture of rejoicing I have ever seen. You've heard me share this before, but I'm going to share it again. The most, that's rejoicing right there. She's excited. I'm coming down the aisle. Get out of my way, people. One of the most powerful pictures of rejoicing I have ever seen was in Lufkin, Texas. It was one of the most heart-wrenching moments you've ever experienced, but it was one of the most beautiful moments in life. And I'll explain to you. We were doing revival at our church. We were standing outside, and we heard this big bang, and we knew it had to be a crash. We head down to where the crash was on a very bad curve. Sure enough, two teenagers whose parents did not know they had snuck out of church. It was a Wednesday night. They had left church early. One was 16, one was 14. The 16-year-old just got his license. He takes the curve way too fast, can't handle it, winds up in a pine tree. 16, I said 14, right? Yes, 16 to 14. 14 year old is killed instantly. They go into the church and tell the parents, You need to come. Because your child has been killed. No, no, our, church, our child is in church. They get to the, to the wreck. The mother of this 14-year-old gave the greatest example of what it is to rejoice that I've ever heard. She said, God, thank you for the 14 years you gave me my boy. Now, you want to talk about understanding how to rejoice? And, and, and when life doesn't go our way, oh, this woman lost her child. And all she could think to do at that moment was thank God for those 14 years. Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Folks, prayer is not just words. It's an attitude. 
Prayer is a behavior. Prayer is your life. Constantly taking things before God, praying, seeking God, something that we do not do near enough. As a matter of fact, I I will tell you that I believe with all my heart that a church is only as strong as their prayer life. A church is only as strong as their prayer life. Pray without ceasing. Constantly bring everything before God. And in so doing, you will be able to give thanks. Give thanks. Even if it's for a 14-year-old that was taken from you, you can still give thanks to God. I want to real quickly read some scripture. And uh, we understand love leadership, honor leadership. You, you do a great job with that. I think sometimes we make excuses for people's behavior. So that's something that we have to work on here at our church. So we need to learn to admonish. And then we encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Boy, there's something else that I believe we probably all struggle with at times. Some of you have been praying for your spouse for so, so long, and you're like, God, are you ever going to hear me? You've been praying for your children for so long, God, are you going to hear me? Folks, be patient with everyone. Let me tell you one of the biggest problems we have, and, and I, this is going to sound kind of weird because I... I believe in evangelism, and I believe that, that without a doubt, God is one who, his story deserves to, to be champion. We should be talking about Christ in every place that we go. But do you know that sometimes you can be so right and so churchy that you push off your own family? Be patient with them. You don't have to tell them every single thing that they're doing wrong. They probably already know a lot of the stuff they're doing is wrong. But if all they ever hear from, the, from you that go to church is, well, I can't believe you do that. I mean, who would not want to come to church with you? Show them the love of Christ. Love them. Sacrifice for them. Give to them. Live at peace. Do all these things, and you'd be surprised at what a testimony that would be. We don't seek revenge. We always seek what is good. We rejoice always. We pray without ceasing. In everything we give thanks. And if we're doing those things, then we can properly put a plan in place for our church prayer list. So let's begin here. Pray that the gospel will take root in the hearts of all people. Pray for the gospel. You want to put this on top of your prayer list. Pray for the gospel that it will take root in the hearts of all people. Colossians 4.3 says, Praying at the same time for us as well, that God will open up to us a door for the word so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I have also been imprisoned. He's not asking that God would open the, 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 the chains that are around his arm or the guards that are there, but instead he's asking for him to open a door for the word. Open the hearts of those that are around him as he's in prison for the word of God, that he might proclaim the mystery of Christ, which I have also been in prison. Paul is saying, listen, imprisonment doesn't bother me. All I'm asking for is that the word of God be championed, that Christ be made known, that the gospel be proclaimed. Folks, the very first prayer that should be upon the lips of Pine Island Baptist is that the gospel be proclaimed from every member that is a part of Pine Island Baptist Church. That should be the very thing that drives our prayer life is God, open a door for the gospel today. Lord, give me opportunity to share the good news of Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 2.1 says, First of all, then, I urge that request, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made in behalf of all people. Who are we supposed to be trying to win to Christ? Who are we supposed to be trying to share the gospel to? The gospel with everybody. Everybody.
Folks, it's so easy to pray for ourselves, for our family. The Bible says to pray for all people. The neighbor you don't like. The boss you can't stand. The teacher who's so, so mean. For the teacher, the kid that you want to lay your hands on, pray. For the parent who thinks that their kid is perfect, pray. (laughs) We're to pray. We're to pray for the heart of those people to have it open to the gospel. Pray that God is champion within the lives and hearts of each person at Pine Island that that then trickles out to all of Waller County and to the counties that surround us and then finally to our state, to our nation, and to our world. How many of you in here have ever been on a mission trip? If you've been on a mission trip outside of the United States, just raise your hand real quick. Have you ever been on a mission trip outside of the United States? All right, very good, very good. How many of you have been on a mission trip inside the United States? Just raise your hand real fast. All right. Here's what I want to do. Next summer, we will have some solid dates. And if you did not raise your hand, I want you to be able to raise your hand this time next year. I want you to be able to say, you know what? I didn't want to go. (laughs) I had no desire to go. But man, am I ever glad I went. God has, has called you and I to be people of prayer for the gospel. But not only are we to be people of prayer, but remember what Oswald Chambers said. God's going to include you. Corey Ten Boom said, be ready to take part. You should be going on mission. By the way, do you know you can go on a mission trip at your job, at a family reunion, at the doctor's office, wherever it is that God sends you, you're on mission. Then we pray for the sick. James 5.14 tells us, is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elder to the church and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. When was the last time you just came and said, Brother Tom, I I just need to have elders pray over me? I need to have people come and pray over me. Something we don't normally do here. Something that, that, that has maybe been a, a practice of ours in the past, but it should be because the Bible is very clear that we should pray for one another. If you go and visit some of these that are sick in our church right now, are you just shaking a hand and leaving or are you praying before you go? Pray. Pray for the sick. So in closing, let's do this. We're going to live like a Christian so that our hearts are right, so that we pray before God, we know that we can go confidently, that the Lord will hear us, all right? We're going to pray for the lost. And there are plenty of lost people, correct? We're going to pray for the sick. Ask a question, and I, I'm not picking. I just I want to ask a question. Why did we amen that one, but we really didn't amen the others? I, I'm, I, I'm I'm just asking the question. I'm, I'm I'm asking you to answer that in your own heart. We we recognize the physical, correct? We see the dead grass. We're having to feed cows already. Livestock, having to figure out how we're going to water. They need water to be able to survive. Now we're having people in our own church having to sell cattle that they were not intending to sell. And the market is flooded with people's cows because there's nothing for them to eat, nothing for them to drink. We recognize the physical. God forgive us that we can't recognize the spiritual.
Because, folks, there are people's hearts who are more dry than what you see the ground is out there right now. There are people who have been so hurt and jaded by church that the last place they ever want to come again is to a place that calls itself the people and family of God. Pray. Pray for the gospel to have a place, a door open so that it can enter. Yes, we pray for rain. But folks, if rain's the first thing you're praying for every time you pray, there could be a reason that our country is in trouble and our churches are hurting. It is because we are not able to recognize the spiritual. As believers, the spiritual is much more important than the physical. As a lost and dying world, the spiritual is much more important than the physical. We must pray for their eyes to be open and the door of their heart to be open to the gospel. Father, we thank you that you love us, and we thank you, Father, that you give us opportunity. to pray, to seek you above all things. So God, this morning we pray for the doors of the lost, the hearts, the doors of the heart of the lost to be open to the gospel. For people to come and to know the one and only We pray this morning, Father, that you will take and, Father, bring rest to the weary, that you will encourage the hearts of the faint-hearted. And those, Father, who have seen nothing but pain in these past few years, may they find reason to rejoice. And, Father, if we have been born again, we have reason to rejoice. Yes, Father, we pray for rain, we pray for the sick, but God, above all, we pray for the spiritual needs. And we trust this to you, Father, in Christ's name I pray, amen. Let's stand together.